So without further ado, hello everybody and welcome. My name is Damien Shield and I'm the Senior Director for the Institute for Medical Simulation at the Center for Medical Simulation here in Boston, where I lead our faculty development and instructor training programs. Welcome to this weekly webinar with our hope, which we're hosting uh, online internationally. It's in the series of Meet the Author and we're privileged to have Dr. Grace Eng and Dr. Danny Lugasi from the New York Simulation Center for the Health Sciences in New York City as our panelists and presenters. And I've uh, worked closely with both of them for over a decade and consider them great friends and colleagues. So it's really a special opportunity for me. And I'd like for them to introduce themselves and uh, then hand back to me for some introductory remarks and we'll get started. So Grace. Thank you, Damien. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Grace Eng. I am currently the Nursing and Health Professions Director at the New York Simulation Center for the Health Sciences. We are affiliated with both the City University of New York and also NYU Langone Health uh, and NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Um, personally, uh, my background is that I've been a nurse for 22 years, and I'm also a midwife. I've been working in simulation since 2008. And in, in the last nine years or so, my, one of my main focus at work is focused on faculty development, especially on developing expertise in debriefing. Um, so, um, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to help and develop other skills in debriefing. So um, today we're really happy and pleased that we have a chance to share our work with all of you. Danny? Hi, everybody. Uh, Danny Lugasi, he, him, his. I'm an emergency medicine physician and toxicologist at the same institution, along with Dr. Eng at the SIM Center. We often call it NISIM for short. Uh, I'm the medical director and work very uh, closely alongside Grace as far as faculty development and really uh, onboarding new and you know, more experienced faculty in the use of simulation and debriefing. And just want to thank CMS again um, for having us. We're excited to share this um, research project with you. And we're also really excited towards the end of this um, session to hear how, what you think about it and, and what your thoughts are. Um, so thank you very much. For those of you who aren't as familiar with our organization, the Center for Medical Simulation is an independent nonprofit in the Boston area that's affiliated with all of the major teaching hospitals of the Harvard Medical School. Our mission is to use simulation to improve safety, quality, and education in healthcare. And we've been at it since 1994, doing what we think of as thought leadership, framework development, and um, taking the form of courses for clinicians in, in the Harvard system, faculty and instructor training programs, both in Boston and internationally and increasingly on the web, hosting fellowships and fellows and visiting scholars and working on organizational strategy and consulting with our partners and affiliates, both nationally and internationally. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, we developed this program of the weekly webinars to have regular relevant open access international events that keep us together, learning together and problem solving together during this um, very impactful time when we've really had to reinvent every aspect of our work. I'm sure many of you who are in healthcare simulation and in leadership across health systems and health, education, health professions education schools are facing the same dilemmas how do we accommodate trainees needs? What are the faculty development requirements? What is our strategy? What is our value add? And we've done various formats on this webinar series to have open forum, to have meet the author panels, hear about the ins and outs of publications, how they got developed and what the findings to go beyond what's on the written page. We've had specialized panels and keynotes and special workshops and they're broadcasted live on Wednesdays, but also recorded and available on our website. I saw this on Twitter today uh, from Eric Topol. The question is, 
when is that new normal people speak of coming? Are we there yet? And one of the reasons why our team at the Center for Medical Simulation, too many to name to make these series possible, we're still at this because we think this is our new normal, being connected internationally, online. There's never been a better time to innovate in this space and to take advantage of what it does afford. So very excited that you're all here. Do take advantage of the recorded series. We've had a number of amazing presentations, luminaries and interesting conversations that have been quite relevant. I highly recommend taking a look at that. For today's session, I'm, uh, we welcome Grace Eng and Danny Lugasi to talk about their study, a pilot study to explore novice debriefers post-simulation debriefing experiences. I was uh, thinking about this yesterday because I was working with a group of novice debriefers about what theories to use in, in their own practice as developing educators, opening up a whole window into the mental models that theory and frameworks provide. And one of the uh, topics that's very relevant to this article is the model of expertise development. And one of the uh, areas that interest always interested me is that when one becomes expert in a particular domain, we automate the thought patterns that are required for that activity, which means that as expert healthcare simulation practitioners or debriefers, we lose sight necessarily to become an expert, we lose sight of what it was like to be a novice. And so I really appreciate this work of research to get us into the minds of those folks that we can no longer relate to and to help inform curricula in that. So I'm looking forward to learning about that uh, today. And so the agenda is to have these introductory remarks, then hear directly from the authors and they have a a presentation prepared for us. We'll be using the Q&A function of, of um, Zoom. So you'll see a button on your screen called Q ampersand A. There, though it's stated as a Q&A, we want you to use that freely to communicate with the panelists. So go ahead and you can start practicing by clicking that Q&A button and introducing yourself, letting us know where you're joining from, and we'll be scanning that so we're aware who's on the live audience and narrating that back so that we can uh, have that available. We'll also ask you to share your questions through that format so that I can collate them for the Q&A part of the session at the end today. And uh, before we wrap up, I'll share with you a couple of possible next steps for you to continue remaining. And uh, just to say thank you already for uh, those who are sharing, I know folks, I see folks from Bloomington, Illinois, Toronto, Ontario, uh, someone from Einstein, maybe that's in the Bronx, the wonderful university and hospital system. Thank you from west of Ireland, near Noosa, Australia, from my old country of Buenos Aires, Argentina. That's great. Welcome. Uh, Utah, Burlington, Vermont, and local here in Boston. Thank you to all of the, those of you. Who, uh, who are connecting with us there. These are of course our stated objectives. You've seen them. We wanna discuss common debriefer experiences who are new to post-simulation debriefing and also explore the strategies to facilitate building the expertise. And at the same time, I wanna now invite you to the Q&A to share with us now and throughout the conversation what else is on your mind? What brought you here? What were you hoping for? Because uh, it'll help inform um, our, about our audience and uh, that'll, I think the authors would appreciate as well as myself to make this interactive because while we're quite happy with the online space, we also realize it, it, it does require attention and uh, nurturing to our community of practice. So. I invite you again to use the Q&A to let us know what you're hoping to gain. And um, I'll turn it over to our panelists without uh, much more delay. So I'll stop sharing so you can take it from here. 
Great, thank you, Damien. I'm gonna share my screen now. So um, I just wanted to say again, we were so thrilled when we found out that we would have the opportunity to talk about our research study focus on exploring the experiences of novice debriefers. Um, this was the study that we were so excited to do. And we did the study pre-pandemic. And as the pandemic came upon us, we are real, realizing um, what we learned from this study is so applicable during the pandemic world and post-pandemic as well, just because so many educators are kind of thrown into simulation just because of patient acuity needs and also lack of access to clinical sites with so many health professions. Student simulation is really becoming more and more relevant in the world of health professions education. And we're really thinking that there are significant implications from our findings that's related to faculty development, health professions, educations, and perhaps even broader implications for simulation as a field of professional practice as well. So what we'll do in this webinar today is we want to start with sharing how we got the idea for the study and the background. Then we'll share the aim of our study, our research question, our methods, our analysis, our findings, our conclusions and implications. And then finally, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So how we got the idea to do this study really came from our work at our beautiful simulation center in New York City. And as Danny mentioned, uh, we go by NISIM. And at NISIM, Danny and I work with instructors from both the City University of New York uh, as well as NYU Grossman School of Medicine, as well as the broader um, NYU Langone Health System. And all of them are large systems with a large number of learners and instructors. And we do about 1200 programs a year. So we have the opportunity to in interact with health professions instructors from a wide variety of background. One of our main focus at work is to help instructors develop their simulation and debriefings and faculty development is a key component of that. We do run a three day intensive faculty development course six times a year. In addition to that, we also provide uh, program specific just in time faculty training for debriefing as well as other methods to coach instructors on how to debrief. So Danny, I'm thinking between you and myself over the years, we've done faculty development outside of the US around the world. Uh, certainly had a lot of interesting experiences and we probably trained more than 600 faculty in debriefing, probably close to 700 by now. And assimilation expanded exponentially over the years and even more so during the pandemic. What we realized was that the majority of instructors we work with are new to simulation and are novice debriefers. Many of them have been teaching for a long time, but they have not used simulation or done debriefings before they came to us. Some of them came very willingly, but to be honest, some of them felt like they don't, now don't have a choice because of the limitations of COVID. And we noticed that they seem to struggle quite a bit through the debriefing process. And to us, that's completely understandable. Assimilation and debriefing presents a whole new paradigm for teaching and learning. And as we work with them, we recognize that novice debriefers have a unique set of needs, and we want to make sure our faculty development efforts are tailored to fit their needs as much as possible. And for us as career simulationists who care a great deal about faculty success, we have a vested interest and we said to ourselves that if only we can see debriefing through the lens of people who are new at this. And we felt so deeply that if we can get a full and deep understanding of the true struggles, um, if we can understand and uncover what they see as obstacles and what was helpful to them, what felt natural and what felt awkward, then we can really help and support them in a meaningful way. So um, we decided to do a qualitative study focused on their perspective because we want to understand the hows and the whys 
And we want to look for rich in-depth descriptions of their thoughts, their feelings and struggles. And we thought a qualitative approach could provide us with the depth in the ways that a quantitative study won't be able to provide. So to get started on our journey, we first reviewed the literature on debriefing. We wanted to be able to articulate the importance of debriefing from the empirical evidence that currently exists. We found several studies, including two systematic reviews and a comparison study and others. We weren't disappointed in what we found. We found that research findings in the empirical uh, research point to the importance of debriefing for learning. What this means to us is that debriefing needs to be done and it needs to be done well in order for learning to occur. However, from what we could see from our own experiences in faculty development, when an instructor is new to debriefing, it is likely that they struggle through the debriefing and it may not be the most optimal for learning. Or another way to think about it is the learning may not have reached the maximum potential. So with that, we also thought we should look at the literature about debrief first. What we found was there isn't a whole lot of studies about debrief first. The literature is scant. It was frankly challenging for us to extract consistent results and meanings across different studies. What we did find was that depending on the study, anywhere from 33 to 80% of debriefers can be considered novices and only a small percentage of debriefers use, reported using any established and validated debriefing models. And also debriefers reported the major way for them to improve the debriefing was trial and error using students to test out the process. And to boot, we found no research studies focused on the approaches and experiences of novice debriefers. So we see big gaps in the literature. However, for us in this study, what that also means is that there's no current published definition of what is even considered a novice versus an expert debriefer. And this has some implications as to how we think about our study and also pro probably um, how we think about the briefing skill acquisition um, in the broader field of simulation practice. We wanted to look further, wanted to cover all the bases as to what we currently know. So we also looked at other evidence relevant to debriefing and debriefer skill set. Looking at the Inaxel standards of best practice in debriefing, the guidelines show that expertise of the debriefer is critical in ensuring learners achieve the best possible learning outcomes. And not only that, but also the debriefers need to possess an extensive list of skills. And these are just a couple of examples, including cover all learning objectives, facilitate reflection, incorporate teaching and feedback, manage student questions, maintain psychological safety, use theoretically supported model to conduct debriefing. And I could go on, but the list was overwhelming just reading through um, this list of um, guidelines. So, for, to us, after diving into the literature, we were convinced and also excited that we were onto something worth exploring. We wanted to make sure we meet the needs of the novice debriefers. And we have some ideas from our practice, but we don't have clear evidence directly from novice debriefers to guide our efforts. Okay, so now at this point in the webinar, we want to take a pause and turn to you. We want to ask you a question and would we we would want to invite you to respond in a poll. So um, we are wondering, how do you self-identify as a debriefer? Uh, wh what is your level of debriefing expertise? And please choose from novice, advanced beginner, competent, proficient, or expert, and there are no right or wrong answers. We just wanted to get to know you a little bit and get a sense of where you're coming from. So the poll numbers are still coming in. Um, and this might be a tough question and we re require some thoughts from some people, just because as we said before, there's no definition for each of us that we can gauge our own progress. 
So looking at the poll results now, um, maybe a large majority of people are divided um, between self-identifying as a novice and also an advanced beginner. So I'm thinking a lot of the res results that we share today would be directly applicable, or we hope it would be. We're interested to hear how it resonates with you. Number of you rated yourselves as competent or proficient. No one rated themselves as an expert. Um, and for those who rated yourselves as competent, proficient, or thinking um, of expertise, and we are also thinking that what we learn from this study is critical um, to your practice in terms of coaching others or peer mentoring SO, and we'll get to that very shortly. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to close out the poll, and um, I'm going to uh, close that out for a second. Okay. So I'll keep moving on. So we shared with you our initial ideas and what we saw in the literature. We came up with our research question. How do health professions instructors approach debriefing when they are new to simulation? So based on that research question, we developed our sampling techniques and the rest of our study. We decided to do a qualitative study using in-depth interviews. Next, we developed our sampling strategy. We used our purposive sampling technique where participants were targeted based on the experiences of the study phenomena. We did our recruitment from a large multi-professional, multi-institutional simulation center. We used our mailing list that reached instructors both internal and external to our institutions. We continued recruitment and enrollment until we had data saturation, meaning there were no further new information coming in as we continue to enroll new participants. And their responses are very similar to previous participants' responses. We included participants who has a current role in teaching with simulation and debriefing. And we did this pre-pandemic, so um, we, were, we were doing one-on-one -on -one face to face interviews. So we included those who could be present in an in-person interview. And as I'm thinking, the pandemic's probably changed our thinking around that. So for our next study, we might do Zoom. Um, and then uh, in the next inclusion criteria you see here, self-identification as the novice debriefer might be interesting to think about. And um, since we could not find a published definition in the literature, so there was not a time frame or a length of practice that we could go by. Um, we struggled with this criteria for a little bit. We wanted to make sure we're hitting the right population, but we wanted to make sure we, um, we have a little bit of specificity to the purposive sampling technique. We went back and forth for a little while. And if anyone was wondering, that's what takes so long with the IRB. Um, at, at the end, we decided the best way to get participants with relevant experience with the best insight is to ask for participants who self-identify as novice debriefers. So someone has to start somewhere, right? And that someone is us. And we decided this is a good place to start. And I'll tell you, and it turned out at the end, we're glad we did that. And we'll get to that later. And just lastly, just to finish out the sampling, but an exclusion criterion was that individuals employed at the simulation center were excluded from the study. And just to be clear, there were only like very few people. There are three people that work in the simulation center in our reporting structure. And we wanted to make sure that, um, that we do not include them in the study. So as for data collection, we designed the interview guide that we used um, in our in-depth semi-structure interviews uh, to anticipate that each individual interview would unfold, unfold in a different way based on how each participant answered the previous question. Um, so I would say how we developed and came up with the questions was, was by being as curious as we possibly could about the novice debriefers experiences and approaches. And here are just some sample questions. Uh, so we asked, what comes to mind when you hear the term debriefing? How would you describe your debriefing technique? Tell me about a time that your debriefing went well. 
when you have to debrief, how do you usually prepare? And we have follow-up questions for each of the um, initial questions. Um, and average interview time was about 15 minutes. The uh, interviews are audio recorded and transcribed through a transcription service. And we received the transcripts within a day or so after we send them in. The study period was between October 2018 to March of 2019. We used thematic analysis as described by Braun and Clark as a qualitative method. We basically followed the method to start analyzing the data from right from the time we had the transcript from the first interview. We generated the initial codes by hand coding the data and Danny and I have the post-it notes to show for it. Um, we met regularly to review each transcript and discussed it. And what we did was we try as best as we can to look at the data and being very cogniz cognizant of our own possible biases, as well as faculty development educators. Um, we looked at it and modified the codes as needed. And we used an iterative process to sort the codes into categories and look for patterns across the data, eventually fully developing and refining the themes by identifying broad, higher level concepts that can explain the patterns that we see across the data. So basically, in other words, to say it is we follow the techniques described by um, Braun and Clark in the thematic analysis methodology. So in our sample, we ended up with enrolling nine participants from different professions and different institutions. Uh, we enrolled nine um, and we, we actually reached data saturation by eight participants, but we included nine just to verify our decision. So we actually had a lot of interest, but when we reached eight, we got no more new information coming from the participants. But to be honest, we weren't very surprised that we reached data saturation fairly early on, just from what we see and hear from our novice debriefers that we work with um, around the world. Um, we had nine in the study, but we were prepared to interview up to 25 participants if we needed. But what was surprising to us was that while most participants had a few months of debriefing experience, there was one who had more than 10 years of experience in debriefing and still self-identified as the novice debriefers. And again, we'll come back to that later. And this is why we, we we said we're glad we use self-identification as an inclusion criteria, because I think that the, um, the data we were able to get from that is very telling and informative as to how we think about skill acquisition um, and skill debriefer and, and debriefer skill development. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn, to, over, turn it over to Danny to talk about the themes from our study. Thank you so much, Grace. And I just want to mention I'm, I'm monitoring the Q&A and there are some great questions coming through. Some are asking if we're going to talk about different debriefing strategies and how we actually do faculty development and cultural competence in debriefing. I know CMS has had a great webinar on that in the past. We're going to focus and take a deeper dive into, again, the experience of the novice debriefer. And Grace and I often feel that if we understand their challenges, then we think we can be better instructors or debriefing instructors and help them along and recognize uh, what are the, the, the challenges that they face and how we can help them through that process. So uh, I guess next slide, Grace, thank you. Okay. So we found uh, an overarching theme and that's I'm on my own and they're on their own. So that's from the debriefer perspective. And then there were three main themes and two sub themes. The first was winging it. And we'll get into what that means. I think that might um, you know, spark some thoughts in some folks who are listening. Uh, the sub theme of just winging it is see one, do one, teach one, a very all old uh, dogma model of education that many of us have probably heard before a deep divide between me and the learners. And the last of the main themes was debriefing quality, missing pieces of the puzzles. And a sub theme under that was changing views. Next slide. So the first theme, which we called winging it, 
not only do we call it the same, but it was honestly one of the things we heard often from our um, participants and something that Grace and I just recently heard in a debriefing course several times. So winging it is the concept of, you know, not much preparation, not much training. I'm just going to go in there and wing it. Um, minimal or no debriefing training again. And oftentimes folks are making up their approach to debriefing on the fly. Next slide, please. So we wanted to share a few quotes um, with you and, and um, I may truncate some of them for time. And so I'd really love for you to look at our paper where you can take your time reading through some of the quotes. They continue to resonate with me, things that I've probably said or thought in my own mind when I started out debriefing and things that we're hearing. So under winging it, we heard someone say, I would say my general technique is I just kind of wing it. Uh, I haven't had much training. Uh, I haven't really read about how to debrief in depth, but I feel like if I just wing it a lot of times, I guess, or just sort of generally try to guide people through it. And um, the, the way that I feel like people were when I was a trainee. So next slide. Um, here's a quote. I remember thinking to myself, if I just start with an open-ended question, um, then I'll get what I need and then I can move on to my teaching points. But that didn't work. And at a time it was unclear to me why that necessarily didn't work. So I remember asking people, how do you think that went? And there was kind of crickets or silence. Um, that it's so silent you can hear crickets and actually figuring out how people get to participate in debrief uh, and debrief it debriefing was tough. Next slide. Uh, last one on wing it here. In, in the beginning, it was just simulating a patient, then teaching what occurred, and there wasn't much reflection. So this is someone reflecting back on their early experiences. For example, we had a patient with asthma or myocardial infarction, and I explained to them that this is what the patient problem was and what you should have done. It was more about knowledge and also about skills, but didn't really reflect. So not being able to have their um, learners reflect in the debriefing. Next slide. So um, I, I heard this for years, probably from the moment I entered medical school. See one, do one, teach one. So watch me do this procedure, then you get to do it, and then you should teach it to the next person. I think most folks on this call probably recognize that is not an optimal way um, to transmit educational information. Um, and so what we learned from our participants, most do not, did not have any formal training in debriefing. Um, most did not even have an opportunity to debrief with an experienced debriefer. So there wasn't even that C1. Um, and they relied on the experiences that I often say was modeled for them. So if they ever experienced simulation and debriefing, they often fell back on debriefing in the style that they were debriefed. Next slide. So here's a, a couple quotes. I think a lot of it was observation because we've gone through so many sims as part of our training um, and using the plus delta model. So that's kind of what I've adopted. Then asking those standard questions, um, was there a clear team leader? How do you think the communication was? These are standard debriefing setups, uh, questions that I've observed, and that's what I emulated. Next slide. So moving on to our second theme, deep divide between me and the learners. And this is one that I think I expected, but always troubles me because I'm always worried about this in my debriefing. And I know that this can really derail a debriefing when we're not on the same page with our learners. So our participants often let us know that they felt disconnected from their participants and learners. And they often felt that they were in an oppositional dynamic, which is not the way I think a, a great education dynamic um, could be set up. Participants often didn't communicate their feedback and opinions, and often their emotions were not voiced as the learners. And learners were really then left to figure out you know, what went wrong, quote, in the simulation or, or figure out what could have gone better. So this to me is, is one of the most troubling to hear. Um, so here's a quote. I was really quite dismayed at how bad they were. I was surprised at how badly it went. 
the difficult part was trying to have a bit of a poker face with not letting them know how disappointing that was. Because th these are people that have done basic life support, advanced cardiac life support courses. Um, that was probably the toughest part was to try to have this conversation to let them know what went wrong without my jaw being on the floor the entire time. Like, how are you guys this bad? <laughs> so um, again, we want to remember to hold the basic assumption about our learners, but this participant um, was saying, wow, this performance was so terrible. And I don't know how to debrief this. I was having trouble um, figuring out how, how, how to get in there and have a critical conversation that obviously needed to be had, had here. That was like pulling my teeth or it was just dragging. They're shy, they don't wanna speak up, they don't wanna participate. Then you ask questions and it's just, you know, crickets. So again, how do we get folks to share as the learners in the debriefing? Next slide. Another one here. The positive always was taken well. The negative, I'll try to get them to explore and let them come up with the mistakes they did, how they want to address them. So this might be a Socratic technique. Instead of um, maybe getting there and having a difficult conversation about performance that you thought should have gone differently or could have gone better, you rather try to tease it out of them and maybe ease in and save face and allow them to let you know what went wrong. Next slide. So debriefing number three, I think was a piece of the puzzle that Grace and I literally had to put together. But what we were hearing, hearing about debriefing quality where there were missing pieces for participants. Um, the participants wished to conduct debriefings well. I think they held the basic assumption about themselves that they wanted to perform well and lead a great debriefing. Um, but they were missing key aspects of knowledge. And oftentimes, they recognize this. Um, instead, they use their own personal criteria. And so they didn't have anybody oftentimes to watch them or mentor them. Um, you know, when the learners were talking, it was the sole criteria that a debriefing was successful. Um, and again, yeah, that's part of a successful debriefing when there is participation. But I think many folks who've done several debriefings realize just speaking from the learners doesn't necessarily mean they're walking away with, um, with learning or different pieces of education you'd hope they would. Next slide. So in this theme, a couple of quotes, to be completely honest, I'm not sure what you meant by go well. I feel like what happens is because we leave a lot of time for the debrief. Um, we usually sort out, corral everybody in a space. People are talking, revealing what they wanna know. And if they said something didn't go well, would, would be the one where their residents were just talking at all. So uh, weren't talking at all. So again, when we ask folks, when did your debriefing go well? When did it not go well? Oftentimes the criteria was talking went well, not talking didn't go well. Next slide. Um, and again, I think that this uh, quote here really just highlights it again. The more the students spoke, um, less it felt like pulling teeth. That was, quote, their evaluation or performance of their own debriefing, uh, saying that it went well. Next slide. So a sub theme here were um, the changing views. So several participants um, did actually have some simulation instructor course uh, training and their view on debriefing quality broadened even after brief exposure to some training. Um, and I, I think we're, we're gonna move a little bit forward um, and back to Grace in a moment. So I want you to take a look in our paper and read through some of the quotes we're sharing today and, and some more that we have uh, published in our in our paper. Uh, next slide. Yep. Yeah. So, going to turn it back to Grace here as we're going to move towards our discussion and conclusions. Yeah. Thank you, Danny. And Danny, please feel free to chime in because um, I think it's really important to spend time thinking about this. So, what after we did this study? So, um, we want to share a few conclusions and discussion. Um, there were many. That we many conclusions that we drew from the study. We can't talk about them all today. Uh, we would encourage you to look at our paper to get a fuller picture. But the main ones were, that we found um, 
was that without training or mentorship, novice debriefers were not able to conduct debriefing in accordance to uh, with recommended best practices. And frankly, this is fairly expected from our standpoint as experienced faculty development educators. However, the next conclusion that we're gonna show you show others who are not me and Danny have a different standpoint. So just to know that this perception exists. So our participants and others they work with, what I mean by that is for example, their boss who send them to say, go do this debriefing now. So um, they, they, they seem to have this perception that debriefings can be delivered effectively without any training or ongoing deliberate practice. See one, do one, teach one was thought to be sufficient preparation for debriefers. So that was the prevalent belief when our novice debriefers first got started in debriefing. However, this notion was perhaps quickly refuted by their own learners by the silence or disengagement because our participants quickly found out that the debriefing wasn't always effective when there were no participation, uh, preparation or training. We also noticed that health profession educators mainly preferred learners to self-identify what they did wrong in the simulation. Uh, there was a prevailing attitude that you should be able to self-reflect immediately and spontaneously to know what you did wrong. Needing help to identify what went wrong is considered a bad thing. And this realization is concerning to us because we would advocate for a culture of learning where admitting not knowing things and discussing mistakes, especially in SIM, should be accepted and even encouraged. Um, but this is mainly not the case um, in our study. We do have some limitations in our study. It is a pilot study done at a specific SIM center at a specific geographical location. And then also the participants self-identified as novices and self-selected for participation. And what that means is that we could have missed those who did not self-identify as novices, but it did in fact have some of the approaches and behaviors of typical um, novice debriefers. So some, some of them might think they're amazing, but they're actually pretty novice. Um, I think it's really important to, to wrap up our presentation by thinking through what are the implications for future research and also for practice. So there are many paths for future research that we could think of. Just as a quick example, um, we could develop a program of research focused on novice to expert development in debriefing, um, thinking that there should be a predictable progression through novice to expert. What if we do studies to identify key attributes of debriefers at various levels? And from that, we can develop a, come to put together a developmental for building expertise. So as for how we apply our findings of faculty development, an obvious one to us is we recommend that novice debriefers receive some kind of preparation prior to conduct debriefings. If possible, take a course. If there are constraints, perhaps some program specific just in time training and having access to a faculty guide developed by an experienced simulation educator would be tremendously helpful to both the debriefers and the learners. The other thing to think about is we would recommend discussing themes from this study in faculty development programs. And we started doing this in our three day intensive course. And we believe that normalizing the common challenges, feelings, or thoughts in novice debriefers, it's tremendously important. It can help alleviate some of the anxiety and self-doubts for novice debriefers to know that they're not out of the norm. Um, and having knowledge of the common approaches is extremely powerful. It can serve as a basis for ongoing reflection and they can gauge their own progress by comparing their own patterns with what we've identified in this study. And also debriefers with more experience, if they're in the same course or outside, can use these findings to provide guidance or mentoring for coaching and feedback as well. We wanted to expand the implications towards the greater community of health professions, educators and leaders to think about the prevailing views and attitudes towards um, learners' mistakes, especially in simulation. If learners felt that they were on their own and uh, on opposing sides from the instructors, then not only will they feel unsafe 
can feel unengaged in simulation. I'm thinking many of us have heard learners come into sim and the first thing they say is, oh, I hate sim. And sometimes that's because they had some really unhelpful experiences in previous simulations. So but thinking of it maybe cumulatively, um, a negative attitudes towards learners mistakes in sim could contribute towards a larger organization culture for learning, reflective practice for improvement, both currently and in the future, because we kind of know that, you know, how we've experienced how being taught is how we teach people in the future. So that's something to think about for now and also for the broader future direction of health professions education. Lastly, we wanted to share with you in the US, there's a saying that we need to see the forest for the trees meaning we should strive to see the overall pattern and meaning whenever possible. And we found that many health professions educators felt that simulation and debriefing required no special preparation or specialized knowledge or skill set. And we feel that this viewpoint is perhaps mistaken or misguided and professionalization of simulation is rapidly growing and coming together as a distinct field of professional practice with a unique body of knowledge. And for career simulationists and our allies, additional efforts to promote the perception of simulation as a field of study is needed. And if we don't do that, it means that there's a great risk that simulation programs won't receive the adequate support and resources needed to reach the maximum potential. So with that, that's kind of um, a summary of our thoughts. We're coming towards the end. Danny and I shared our experiences and takeaways from this study. So now we wanted to turn to you. Um, hope you can share some of what are your key takeaways and we would invite you to type it in the Q&A. And Demian uh, can also open up to the audience for questions and answers as well. And I've been monitoring. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Demi. No, uh, let me just start by saying thank you very much for your insightful presentation. The 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 way you uh, share the quotes really makes the that come to life for me, and I greatly appreciate that window in not just into the thoughts of the novice debriefers, but also into your assessment of the data and uh, take on the implications. I uh, a number of key lessons there that I, I think will be so helpful for all of us. Um, and, a, and I think also an appreciation that you noted a gap in the literature and the field and uh, did the hard work of taking that leap to name a, a criteria and, and see what it brought. So um, very, again, very appreciative and informative. I, I, I would like to engage with the audience if they would with, uh, as you appealed for, uh, they could share a reflection as, as I have on what they're hearing and how it's impacting their thoughts on faculty development. And while they do that, I, I do myself have a, a thought or a question to ask you about. Yeah, I noticed some great uh, Q and A's during, and, and someone asked, you know, should I pass along my debriefing gaps and errors to novice debriefers I mentor? And then someone just put in very validating to my personal experiences of mentoring new sim educators. I, I love that. And as Grace mentioned, I think normalizing and validating both ha can help me mentor novice debriefers. But as Damian mentioned, it, it it's hitting a personal reflection when we were doing this study. It was it was bringing me back to when I struggled as a novice debriefer. And I'll say, Damien at the beginning said, we often automate things as we become more proficient and experienced. And it reminds me when I ask folks in a sim, wow, that was great. How did you come about to do this? They often say, that's just what I do. And, and they need some help thinking back about how did they get to that point? So I think this has really helped me. Well, and, and that's, where I thought I would begin with the questions. And uh, it is inspired in a way by that audience member who said, you know, what about the motivation for the faculty to learn about debriefing, which I think was bookended by Grace's comments on professionalizing the field and um, that effort for a 
what's the reason for faculty development? How do we go at this? So one of the one final way I process what you presented is that that theme of the deep divide is a major hurdle to cross, helping people understand their spouse theories and compare them to their theories and actions. So I thought I was wondering if you might comment a bit further on strategies in the in your faculty development program, whether it's formal or informal, to address that uh, such that, so how do you deal with the motivation? How do you deal with the self-assessment? Grace, you wanna start off? And, and, and I, yeah. I, as you do that, I, I what, the thing that I keep on thinking about is how do you balance the transactional and the transformational? How do you, what do you do to help people with skills versus really challenge their belief system? How, how do you navigate that? Such great questions. Thank you, Danny and Demian. And Danny, please feel free to chime in. I'll start. I do honestly think it requires a reframing on the debriefers part to think that learning is a relational construct. And what I mean by that, there, learning reaches a certain limitation when there is no perceived positive relationship between the instructor and the learner. So if as debriefers, we continue to see the learners as the mistake makers or people I need to correct and watch them, then catch their mistakes. I think that it really puts a, a lot of limitations as to what our learners would walk away with from the sim. And, it, and how could we blame, blame anyone that it creates a divide? Why would our learners feel connected to us if they don't feel like we're on their side? So, and, and not to get too meta, but as faculty developers, do you find yourself, and even in this research, do you find yourself dividing you the expert from them the novice, and how do you avoid that? Danny, should I, should I start too? Sure, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, th so Demian's super, meta question. Um, you know, we were kind of in a bind to and as researchers, we wanted to um, be very cognizant of our biases, especially in a qualitative study, because we wanted to be able to conduct the interview and assess the data in a way that we are not biasing the findings with our own personal experiences that may not be transferable to everyone else. So I have to be honest, and I don't know if Danny, you felt the same. When I was doing these interviews, I was sitting face to face with some of the participants and I've worked with some of them, or I know of some of them before. We didn't say in our study that we make sure that Danny in only interview people that he does not work with. And I only interview people that I don't directly work with, but I know of them. Um, and I do hear their, their struggles. And you know, in my mind, I was thinking, I know uh, so some of the ways that you could improve and not feel so frustrated all the time, but we kind of have to keep to our keep to our objective, which is gleaning their insights. But at the end or after the process so over, we did share some of our resources that are available to them as well. Danny, what do you, how do you see? Well, I wanted to jump in with a couple quick, very practical things to Damien's question of how do we get buy-in that debriefing is a skill that should be practiced, that should be thought about. So I remember Dan Raymer, uh, one of our colleagues and, and you know, world-renowned SIM expert said, you know, being a great lecturer doesn't make you a great debriefer. And, and for me, he was making the analogy that we've all gone to different lectures. There are some people who give great talks and some, quite frankly, we fall asleep at. And, we know to become a great orator or lecturer, you have to apply some practice and principles. So I, I see that in debriefing. I had to create my own practice and, and skill acquisition. And I think very practical, if you can do a course, if you can get some mentorship, if you can record your briefings either visually with audio or even just audio on your phone and you have clearance from those in the simulation, and have someone who's more experienced 
listen to that and give you feedback, that's probably the most valuable thing that has helped me improve my debriefing skills. And again, that's what I've heard from others that has been most valuable for them. Even five minutes of listening into their debriefing and giving them feedback was more valuable than five months of just reading about it or thinking about it. Yeah, and I, I think it's your article and presentation gives us insight into how left un, untouched or without mentoring the, and coaching and developing and more training, we're going to continue having this revolving door of people who teach with simulation and they're going to continue and they're going to come in as novices, experience a frustrating debriefing, find it hard, finding that they're winging it, not feeling the traction, having all that internal conflict and then um, going out the door into other types of teaching. Um, and so we kind of redirecting folks into a more productive, more enjoyable kind of a practice. I, I you know, some of the, this is Colleen Ryan, a colleague of ours from Australia is commenting how, how frustrating it, it is to have to develop new people over and over. And so I very much share that. Um, so I, I think one of the takeaways from here that I'm getting, so Danny and Grace shared that you one can share these themes with the participants and in instructor courses. And I'm taking the idea to also share it with the, the C-suite, the decision makers, the funding, um, the chairs of departments to say, look, we're going to continue exercising this, doing this exercise of frustration if we don't invest in our faculty. This is the reason why we should invest in faculty development. There's a paper that came out after your work, I believe, uh, which is this paper from our colleagues, Adam Chang, Walter Epic, Michaela Colby, and others that has a pretty um, detailed description theoretical, not research-based, based on their experience um, that I think is worth the read and would complement your paper greatly. So I want to share that resource with the audience uh, and a couple of others that were mentioned. Uh, the basic assumption, there's a blog post by Jenny Rudolph if you wanna read more about that. And um, our two-part webinar on broaching race and racism, I think was one of Danny's recommendations. Great paper, Damien. I, I found that paper challenged me again to think about the performance or the quality of a debriefing often is centered around the debriefer. And, and I worry that's often too narrow. We don't do enough in many simulations to measure the impact and the learning that happens from the learners when they leave. If we feel it went well, then it went well. Um, they may have had a totally different experience. So it's a little bit out of the scope of our discussion here, but it, it continues to challenge me. Even if I say to uh, someone I'm mentoring, you, that debriefing went well, that's still a narrow centered view around my view as a debriefer. Yeah. And uh, we invite you all to uh, continue connecting us with us in the weekly webinars, as well as on our available online courses. We've transitioned our whole program uh, to the online space for now, and we're excited to reopen in Boston towards the end of the calendar year. The Healthcare Simulation Essentials course is our core instructor training, and there are monthly courses, the next one uh, starting next week. And uh, we also do, to Danny's last point, if faculty development dash the debriefing assessment and Simulation and healthcare radar training is a very good mode for peer faculty development. If you wanna help coach folks on what's a good debriefing, taking a look at it from the instructor point of view and the learner point of view. So do check out our website for registration information. And I also would like to invite you to partner and connect with the Center for Medical Simulation. Mary Fay, my colleague and I, um, are very interested in a conversation with you to find out how CMS and our uh, various course offers, offerings and consulting may be of benefit to your organization. We're just an email away, so please don't hesitate to reach out 
and join us on the webinar in a recording uh, or in an upcoming course. Thank you, Danny and Grace, again, and thank you all for joining, and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you, Danny, and I just want to say again, what a privilege to share a space with and Damien and Grace, who were my instructors. Yeah, I guess we're done, so sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And we look forward to connecting with you in the future.